Yo, what up? We're back, and uh, you know what we do, baby. We get right into it right from the start, so, uh, you know, let's get it. Let's get right into it. Uh, first fight of the night for uh, UFC on ESPN Plus, or ESPN 3, not ESPN Plus for this one. Maurice Green against Junior Albini, and uh, Maurice Green, he's going to be on a three-fight win streak if he wins this fight, you know, as miraculous as that sounds, but Green, you know, um, he hasn't been what I would call impressive in his UFC tenure. He has a lot to prove. Um, his last fight in my opinion, was pretty awful for both guys, but he was taking the fight on short notice. He was able to get the win, and, you know, I would hope he would come in here uh, in this fight sharper and better shape. He definitely didn't look like in the greatest shape in that fight, but uh, Morris Green, he's an interesting guy. You know, he's 6'7", 82-inch reach, uh, fairly athletic, snappy jab. Um, he was able to drop Jeff Hughes with the jab. He will use double jabs to get inside. Um, nice one, too. And he's a pretty good kicker. He throws a good front and round kicks to the body. He'll throw a 1-2 to a body kick combination. Good head kicks. Front kicks to the head. So for a big guy, you know, he has good uh, ability to get that, you know, leg up to the target pretty well. And he likes to throw a lot of lead uppercuts. Uh, nice lead elbows, knees. And he's closed the distance with flying knees, lead elbows uh, when fighters are against the cage. So he definitely is athletic. Like I said, he tends to drop his right hand when he throws a... Uh, a left straight or a jab though and when green gets hurt doesn't really move his feet he'll just shell up against the cage he doesn't have big power either just has one ko he does uh a lot of reacting he gets very defensive when fighters put the pressure on he'll wait for his opponents once he slows down and that's when he kind of gets picked apart in those later rounds he has fought in glory and um he was knocked out twice in both those appearances and he was also here with the big uh, two-piece combination against Juan Espinosa dropped. So to me, his chin is a little bit questionable. He has never been finished by strikes in MMA, though. And uh, he's strong in the kin- in the clinch. You know, he looked to improve that aspect of his game. Good knees to the body and the head. Nice Muay Thai elbows. He was throwing, um, you know, really good shots off the break against Jeff Hughes in his last fight. But he's a poor wrestler. He's not, uh, you know, a great grappler, I would say. He is long, so he's somewhat dangerous in his guard. And he will throw up triangles off his back, and he did get one in his UFC debut. And even though I wouldn't say he's like a Brian Ortega with this technique <laughs> in terms of triangles, uh, not many heavyweights use triangles, so that can be, you know, a benefit to him there because it's easier to catch him because they probably don't defend him as much. And uh, But when an opponent can pass his guard, he really doesn't have much there. He doesn't have much of a get-up game to speak of, and uh, guys can kind of grind him out. But Junior Albini, um, you know, he's, his UFC career is hanging on by a thread here. He's lost three consecutive fights. He's gotten finished in his last two fights, and a loss here, you know, it would almost certainly lead to being or lead to him being cut. And he's just been extremely underwhelming as well himself, you know. And to me, you know, Albini, he's he's more of a stationary guy where he doesn't have a lot of footwork. He just likes to plod forward, and if a guy can, you know, if a guy's coming forward at him, he's a solid counterpuncher, and he's pretty cl- quick. He's nimble on his feet. He can move. Uh, he could throw and counter, and he has, you know, decent hands. And in his last fight, you know, he did show a good game plan in the first round, where he was able to, uh, you know, take down um, Jarzino Rosenstruck in that first round. And you know, he does throw some nice straight shots. He has. You know, uh, good step in knees. But to me, man, I just feel like um, Maurice Green is the faster guy with better movement. And if he just stays at his range and just stays on the outside, those kicks, um, I don't think that Albini is going to be able to close that distance to touch him with his footwork. And I don't think Albini is going to be trying to take him down here. And even if he does, I just don't think that. I mean, if he took him down, I mean, he did take down Jarzinho, but Jarzinho has no grappling. You know, at least Maurice Green, like I was saying, he's somewhat dangerous in the clinch. He's a big guy, and, um, you know, he's dangerous off his back and his guard somewhat. So, you know, I think Albini is going to come in here with the game plan to try to take him down, to be honest. While I think Maurice Green is going to come in here trying to move, stay long, and, um, you know, I think that Albini might take him down. But I think, you know, I don't know if there's going to be a finish in this fight, but I think over the duration of the fight that Maurice Green is just going to, you know, land the more offense, the bigger offense, and uh, just look better on the judges' scorecards. But, you know, I think it's going to be a pretty sloppy fight where, (laughs) 
You know, I, I do favor Maurice Green, though. So I'm going to go with Maurice Green to get the victory there via decision. And uh, up next year, we have a good fight with uh, Emily Whitmire against Amanda Rebus. And uh, Emily Whitmire, she looked excellent in her last match. Uh, she was a sizable underdog, and she was able to submit Alexandra Alba in the first round. It was the fastest submission in uh, women's strawweight history. And she's going to be looking for a three-fight win streak here at Strawweight, a three-fight win streak in the UFC. And Whitmire, she's a more polished striker than Rebus, even though I would say both of them aren't very great strikers. She is a tall fighter. She's going to have a four-inch reach advantage here, a four-inch height advantage. Or a four-inch reach advantage, I'm sorry. But uh, she likes to use a jab, straight right hand. She keeps her uh, punches straight. And I do feel that the jab should cause uh, Rebus issues. And uh, she throws uh, round kicks to the body. I haven't seen her throw up front kicks much, but she was throwing them a little more in her fight against uh, Jamie Moyle. And I think those could be effective. And, um, you know, she will throw decent inside-outside leg kicks. She likes to throw a straight right hand to the body to a uh, body kick combination as well. And uh, she is, like, you know, okay with the feet. She isn't dangerous, but... You know, she's able to keep these girls off her, walk them down, and, you know, be the aggressor at least. And she's, she does stand very tall. She doesn't have the quickest feet. But she's improved her footwork. Um, and she's, you know, able to stay long a little bit better. She isn't dangerous. She doesn't have knockout power. Um, she has been TKO'd one time on tough, but she wasn't really hurt. She just kind of got stuck in a position where she couldn't get out of. And uh, she has no knockouts, but she's big. She's physical for the division. Both of her losses uh, were at 125 pounds. Now she's at 115. She's looked much better here. She's probably one of the biggest 115 pounders on the roster. And uh, she's a wrestler. She has uh, good fast entries on her clinch takedowns. Good job of uh, getting the body lock. She'll find an angle, dump people. And uh, she will control position in the clinch fairly well if she can't uh, land the takedown. And uh, just work with some knees, look for trips against the cage. And her takedown defense is strong. She's very good at, uh, you know, disengaging in the clinch, throwing knees, punches off the break. And she needs to make Rebus pay whenever she tries to get in the clinch in this match. Uh, Rebus is more of a jiu-jitsu takedown girl, so she's going to be trying to get the takedowns through the clinch. But, um... Whitmire, she's not very good off of her back, so if she gets taken down here, it is a worry. Um, she showed slight improvements against Jillian Robertson, but she allows opponents to get to dominant positions. Um, you know, and she's been submitted a couple times, or she got submitted one time, finished on the ground with strikes the other time. So both of the times that she's been finished have been on the ground. And um, she does like to trap the uh, closest arm with wrist control when she gets to top position and uh, move to half guard. She's really heavy there. And uh, she will look for triangles, or I mean for uh, arm triangles, I'm sorry. And also she's just like has good, uh, you know, forearms, good uh, elbows from that position. And um, she was able to take the back lock in her rear naked choke in her last match. So um, she's showing some improvements in terms of... Uh, advancing position looking for submission and uh, she has two submissions she's been submitted twice but um i think what marsha try to use her range outstrike reba she can't allow herself to get backed up too much she needs to try to hold the center she is the better striker she's longer and i think her jab or straight punches they should land all night. You know, Whitmire throws nice hooks inside. She's just a better striker here. She should try to keep it on the feet, like I said, make Rebus pay whenever she tries to get a takedown. And, um, you know, she maybe will be able to take down a, a tired Rebus controller late, depending on how the fight is progressing. But as long as she doesn't get submitted or Rebus isn't much improved, I think Whitmire should take this fight. But uh, Amanda Rebus, she's going to be finally making her UFC debut. She had over three years away from the sport. Um, she was suspended for two years for a failed USADA test, and she hasn't fought fought since uh, June of 2016. And Reba, she's a tough jiu-jitsu black belt. Her striking, from what we what I saw, though, is super low level. She basically has no skill on the feet. I mean, she plods forward with her chin high, spamming one-twos down the middle. She will throw inside leg kicks, overhand right leads. She will throw a left hook right uppercut. I have seen her throw some body and head kicks along with spinning kicks, but they aren't effective. And when she is striking in the pocket, she has slow hand speed. She keeps her chin straight up in the air. She gets tagged with counters, and it really just turns into a 50-50 brawl that she usually loses. 
And uh, when opponents stuff her takedowns, forced her to go backwards. She doesn't have much of anything. She was knocked out by uh, Pollyanna Viana on the feet, who is a very low-level striker herself, which we've seen come to light in the UFC. And, you know, I will say Rebus is tough. She's willing to go toe-to-toe, but unless she's improved her striking a lot, it's a huge vulnerability. And uh, she has three three TKOs, but those are with ground and pound. And uh, she has been knocked out one time. And Rebus is going to look for the submission here. She's a black belt, but she looks much better on top than off her back. And her wrestling is just not very good. She doesn't shoot any standard wrestling shots. She only has jiu-jitsu type takedowns in the clinch. Uh, mainly looking for head and arm throws, which is very risky. I have seen her end up on her back going for that technique. And she will try to roll for leg locks to create another scramble. And uh, when opponents try to take, um, you know, get on top of her, she's good at you know, in her guard, creating scrambles, looking for submissions, but she isn't very proficient at sticking the submissions off her back. And in her last fight with Jennifer Gonzalez, uh, Gonzalez was able to control Rebus in her guard, land some punches, and uh, Rebus has a good defensive guard. She controlled posture well, but she didn't uh, attempt to stand up at all. And um, when she does get the throw, she's very good at quickly moving into mount, raining down ground and pound. She will look for uh, the back end and a rear naked choke. And she's pretty good on top. She has two submissions. She has good cardio. She could push the pace. And it's hard to gauge, you know, how she's going to look here. She may be much improved off these three years. Or she could look rusty. You know, you never know. And uh, Rebus is going to have to get this fight to the ground uh, somewhere, you know, somehow. Even if she has to pull guard on the feet. Even though Whitmire is nothing special. She's just sharper. And in Whitmire's three pro lo- or three pro losses, including Tough... Um, they've all come on the ground. So that has to give Reba some confidence. Um, you know, I think Emily Whitmire will win this match fairly easily, though, if it's the same level Rebus that we've seen. I see it being similar to the fight we saw recently on the Contender Series with Hannah Goldie against Callie Robbins, except I don't think Rebus has as good a striking or as much power as Robbins did. But I think as long as Whitmire doesn't give, uh, this, fight, give this fight away and she stays long... Um, I don't think Rebus will take her down. I think even if she gets top position, as long as she can pass the guard, pass Rebus's guard, she can dominate on top also. And she's just a much bigger, physically stronger fighter. And um, I don't think she's going to get the finish here, but I think she's going to get a fairly dominant decision victory. So I'm going with Emily Whitmire to get it done here. And up next here, we have a highly debated fight. I've seen people, you know, on both sides of this fight with... Uh, Doucha champion, <laughs> I'm just going to call him champion Doucha, I'm not going to call him uh, Lungiambula or whatever, hopefully I've said that right, but, so champion Doucha, he enters his UFC debut, he's the slight favorite, and he's 9-1, and one. he's riding a 5 fight winning streak, and his last 6 fights, uh, they've all been scheduled for 5 rounds, so he's an experienced guy, you know, he's been preparing for title fights, obviously, and uh, he's a big scary guy with 1 punch knockout power, I mean, just look at that picture there in his topology shit i mean goddamn but uh you know he's extremely explosive he's a powerhouse and he's coming off uh winning the heavyweight title in uh efc and he leaves that promotion the light heavyweight and heavyweight champion but you know south african fighters that promotion really hasn't been very good so that's not like a huge feather in his cap let's say but champion dalcha he's more of a counter puncher um but his blitz attacks are extremely dangerous. He does have a solid jab to the body and the head. And he will throw, you know, a jab, left hook, jab, uppercut combinations. Um, he has devastating power in his overhand right. And he's extremely fast, closing the distance. He likes to kind of circle, wait for his opponents to throw, get his reads, and then time shots, time counters. Nasty counter left hook, big counter right uppercut. And he'll throw that combination, that in combination. He doesn't throw a lot of straight shots, and he's very wide with everything besides his jabs, which it does make him vulnerable in the pocket. And I fear that, you know, against a guy like Ledette with a very nice jab, that that could really nullify a lot of his attacks. But, um, you know, he's still dangerous, man. And it's if he, you're brawling with the guy, even if he's hurt, he's going to plant his feet in a wing, and, you know, he could knock you out with one punch. He has four KO TKOs. He's never been finished by strikes. And he looks like a well-rounded guy. He's a decent wrestler. His defensive wrestling and game off his back does look a little bit questionable, but his offensive wrestling is solid. He's extremely explosive. 
He'll get big slam takedowns, and he will shoot uh, decent double legs. And he's good at catching kicks, taking opponents down through that as well. And nice clinch trips, throws. His wrestling, I would say, isn't elite. But, um, you know, it's pretty good. And he has heavy hips. He's good at reversing takedowns, getting top position. But he isn't super dangerous on top. He will throw some small ground and pound from guard. If he can get to a dominant position, then he can close the show on the ground. But he's not a big passer. Prefers to just stay in the guard, control opponents from there. And fighters are able to stand up from under him. Also, he doesn't have the greatest, you know, top control, like I just said. And uh, he can get taken down by body locks, well-timed shots against the cage. Off his back, you know, he doesn't look very good. Doesn't have good get-ups. But in this fight, you know, I don't think that Liddell will be able to take him down. But in his one career loss, he was submitted via rear naked choke. And uh, Douch has two submissions. And in, in this fight, though, Douch is going to have to get inside. He's going to have to get past the jab of Ledet, and his style is very counter-heavy. I think this is actually a tough matchup for him. He's going to have to be more aggressive, use his explosion to get inside, and let his hands go, but he can't be so crazy in the pocket and just wing punches. He has to be a bit more technical, maybe look for takedowns. If he can get top position, I don't think he can do damage, but he could probably control, and uh, Dalcha always has that one chance to land that one hit or quitter also, so... He's a dangerous guy, and uh, he's an interesting guy to uh, enter this division. But uh, Justin Ledet, he's definitely in a do-or-die situation here. Um, since making the move down from heavyweight, he's lost two in a row. He was finishing 15 seconds in his last match, and those were two of the best prospects in the division. So it may be early to throw dirt on Ledet, but at heavyweight in the UFC, uh, he was 3-0. and He showed some promise, and he's a... Former boxer, he's one of the best jabs in the UFC, and he'll double, triple up on it. Really bloody the face of his opponents, and he likes to use a lot of feints um, to disguise when he's throwing the jab to set up his straight right hand. And uh, he has a good uh, check left hook, a good right hook as well. And uh, he'll throw a good fadeaway uh, left hook backing up. But really, he's pretty one-dimensional. He doesn't throw kicks much. He doesn't throw in combination and he really just is looking for the jab left hook. You know, walk his opponents in the jab left hook and go forward with the jab when he uh, wants to pressure and just, you know, keep people at bay. But he's very heavy on his lead leg. That's something that he needs to address. You know, Rocket was able to completely nullify his jab with his uh, leg kicks. And he's a coaster as well. Someone who's fine doing just enough to win and just stay slightly ahead on, on points. And that's a risky thing to do. You know, we've already seen him almost lose a fight that he was clearly the better fighter in against Zuan Yanwu. And he's definitely more of a volume striker. He doesn't have big power. He only has two TKOs. But he has a great chin. And, you know, that is did get uh, caught his last time. You know, that was the first time he's been finished. So it's going to be interesting to see how he comes back if he has the same type of durability. But he is well-rounded. He's earned a UFC submission. He likes to shoot takedowns when he has opponent's backs near the cage. And he has good double legs. He has good guard passing. He'll take the back at rear naked chokes. And, um, you know, off of his back, he has gotten a couple arm bars I've seen on his record against low-level competition. But when Alexander Rockage took him down, he didn't really do anything. He showed a good guard early. He was able to get a butterfly hook or get a butterfly guard, get his feet on the hips. Uh, he brought his legs high a little bit at times for... Uh, to control posture he was also trapping the wrist looking for triangles but after a few minutes on the ground he looked like he kind of gave up all his attacks and just mentally checked out of the fight which isn't good to see but he has five submissions he's never been submitted and Ledet is gonna have to control the center in this match stay long use his jab left hook use those feints and if he goes forward use his feints to drop the looping shots then counters with this you know, a stiff jab, a left hook, a right hand. He could hurt Dolce, and, but this is a very close fight. I think that technically, Ledet is better. He has tighter punches, but he lacks the physicality of someone like Dolce. And I think if Dolce is aggressive in this fight, explodes forward with combinations, uses combinations to counter the jab, he could overwhelm Ledet. I think he definitely hits hard, and Ledet just got knocked out for the first time. So both these fighters are counter punchers who fight moving backwards. So. It will be interesting who decides to go first. And I think if Ledet with his jab um, is probably going to be the one to go first. I think Dalcho can take Ledet down potentially if he wants to use that game plan. But 
I don't know if he could continue that for three rounds. But for me, I think Champion Dutch guys is dedicated. He's extremely pumped for this opportunity. And I just, I don't know. I don't see him letting it slip away. I'm going to say Dalch will be a late first round KO or decision through wrestling. The one thing I'm nervous about for Dalch is that he hasn't, he has taken a year off and he doesn't quite pass that smell test. You know, I don't know if he's taking that year off to, uh, get some Mexican supplements out of his body or he's going to come back looking that same ripped explosive athlete. So, uh, this is a fight that, you know, I'm going to be monitoring as the week goes, but I would say this is like a 50 50 fight, like the odds indicate. And I'm going to slightly favor champion Doucher here. In this fight, uh, I have a pretty confident uh, pick here in Jared Gordon. And I think the name of the game in this fight is going to be Cardio Man. I think that uh, Jared Gordon has one of the best gas tanks in the division. And I think that Dan Moret, he has, um, you know, a gas tank issue. But the thing is that Jared Gordon just got knocked out really badly against uh, Joaquim Silva. And he had some injuries in that fight as well where... You know, it's hard to say if he's going to be coming in here 100%. And he also had a TKO loss to Diego Ferreira. So he's coming off of back-to-back knockouts. But the thing is, when Dan Moret came back against Alex White after that knockout against Gil Burns, to me, man, he looked he didn't look as good, man. His movements were sloppy. Looked like uh, he was kind of very stiff at range. Kind of very a lot of nervous energy. And... Um, really 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 was just diving into that clinch trying to get takedown after takedown after takedown and in the first round it was effective for him he was able to get that takedown take them out land some nice shots he cut open that um cut open the face of Alex White and you know he had an effective first round but you could tell in the second round that that game plan all of those takedowns all of that really started to get into him White started countering with big shots he even locked in a couple of close guillotines and uh Dan Murat started gassing man and then Alex White was putting it to him and almost finished him and that's kind of how the fight ended with Alex White beating him up and he lost the decision and for me man Jared Gordon he has very good takedown defense he's a good grappler and I think he's the better striker here and you know I think that he has the more potential I think that he has the better cardio and I think that what's going to happen here is Jared Gordon's going to be uh you know, early on, Dan Moret's going to be coming in hard for the takedown. I think Jared Gordon's going to defend a few takedowns, land some nice knees in the clinch, land some elbows in the clinch, uh, kind of make Dan Moret question a little bit if he wants to continue to shoot for these takedowns. And then I think that after that, that Gordon is going to start walking him down, landing the harder, you know, better shots. I think you're going to see Dan Moret start to wear down, start to get a little, get a little bit tired, not like that pressure. And I think over the three-round distance that Jared Gordon is going to find a finish via KO-TKO, whether it'll be in the uh, first, second, or third round. I don't think it'll be in the first round, actually. I would say it's definitely going to be either late second round or early third round. And I think it's going to be more an iterative knockout where Jared Gordon is just beating this guy up, beating this guy up, walking him down. You can tell that the energy bomb red is slowly going down. It's slowly going down. And, uh... You know, as well to fight, just going to get completely taken out of him. And I think Jared Gordon is going to get the finish. And I'll say it's via late second round KO, TKO. And uh, up next year, we have Jordan Griffin taking on Vince Murdoch. And uh, Jordan Griffin is going to be trying to get his first UFC win. And in his first fight in the UFC, he had a back and forth fight with Dan Ige, where he had his moments. He won around. And we've all seen what Dan Ige has proven to be. He's a very good fighter. He just beat Kevin Aguilar. So. That is uh, not a bad loss at all. And he was supposed to fight uh, Chaz Skelly. Shout out to Chaz Skelly. I mean, he's part of the uh, MMA betting community. He's a pretty cool dude. And, uh, you know, Skelly had to pull out. So, I mean, Skelly's a pretty high-level opponent. If you're training for a guy like Skelly and now you have to take on a UFC newcomer, you know, you should be in pretty good shape. You should be ready to go. And uh, Griffin, he's a wild man. He's a well-rounded fighter. He has a good knockout power, and he has quite a few submissions, and he's a much bigger fighter and better athlete than Vince Murdoch, in my opinion. And uh, Griffin, he's a southpaw. He's a good distance striker. Um, he uses a lot of louder movement on the outside. Then he'll explode in with combos. Decent jab, good straight left hand. He will throw a, a, a lot of one-twos. He also has a nice uh, jab, overhand left, and he is very aggressive. He's quick closing the distance. When he can back opponents up against the cage, he'll throw wide hooks in combination. And he's good at 
closing off his opponent's exit with those hooks, you know, guessing where they're, which way they're going to try to circle out and uh, just making the hook really long so he can catch them as they're circling away. And um, in round three, if he feels the fight is close or opponents are fading, he's uh, really good at putting the pressure on, forcing opponents to trade, uh, good short hooks, uppercuts, and he's powerful. He has uh, dangerous kicks. He has a good one-two to a rear leg body kick or head kick. And if you time his blitzes, Though fighters can duck under and get easy takedowns on Griffin. But Griffin has good power. He has five knockouts. He has a good chin. And he's a wild man. He has been TKO'd one time. But he's a guy where I think you have to put him out to really stop his forward pressure. Or is just as well to fight. But Griffin is a solid grappler. He has very explosive double leg takedowns. Big slam. Solid body locks as well. He can't shoot from too far out at times. But, you know, people haven't made him pay for it that much yet. His takedown defense isn't great. His style allows wrestlers to, uh, you know, time double legs, duck under, get takedowns. And he is good at uh, standing back up. He has good get-ups. He's hard to hold down. And he's excellent at creating scrambles, jumping on submissions, front chokes, and um, very good guillotine. He will use chokes to roll to top position. And he has a nice anaconda. He's super aggressive on the ground also. You know, he'll jump on rear naked chokes with no hooks. Um, he'll rain down really brutal ground and pound. His reach allows him to stand up over his opponents and their guards, land big punches, and his aggressiveness going for chokes can get him in trouble. He will go for flying guillotines, end up on his back. He can also hold on to chokes for too long, and um, he gives up mount the back pretty easily, but he's calm in those positions and um, knows that he could scramble out. And... Um, you know, he doesn't take huge damage. He doesn't really get submitted. But that's how he did lose to Dan Ige by kind of being on his back. But he'll never break. And, you know, he fights until the end. He's the type of fighter to be losing two rounds to zero and come back get the finish in the third. And if Griffin's last in Griffin's last match, you know, he was able to scramble with a jiu-jitsu black belt. He won his fair share of, them, of the scrambles. And he was able to reverse Ige in round two, land some nasty ground and pound. And uh, he has eight submissions. He's been submitted twice. I'd be very surprised if he got submitted by Murdoch, but Murdoch could maybe take him down. Griffin is a finisher. He has 13 finishes and 17 wins. He's uh, lost his last two decisions. He's only four and three in decisions. I think Griffin is faster. He hits harder. He's going to need to use the same game plan he always uses. Use his athleticism on the feet, eventually get a takedown, finish the fight. And I think that if he can keep the range, he will be able to snipe Murdoch because he tries to close the distance. And I'm not too sure Murdoch has a great chin. I think if Griffin gets top position, he can finish the fight via submission or ground and pound also. And Vince Murdoch, he's making the UFC debut here on short notice. And he trained at a team alpha male. He's 12-3. and three. And he's a smaller 145. He's going to have a 9.5 inch reach disadvantage here. And the level of competition for Murdoch is very suspect. He's been fighting a lot of Indian opponents uh, in his last two fights. He fought in the uh, Indian promotion SFL, SFL where he's had some weird endings. He had uh, one fight and um, because of a small cut in a fight he was clearly winning where I didn't really think it needed to end because of that cut. He also had a fight where he got kicked in the nuts and the ref said it was an inside leg kick and the kick clearly hit the cop and Murdoch was so pissed that he, you know, stopped. He jumped over the cage and just left and the fight's a loss on his sure dog record, a win on topology due to groin strikes. So I'm not even sure how they graded the fight, but Murdoch, he's a striker. He has uh, good hand speed, decent at angling, staying in and out. He has a fast jab, strong one too. He will throw a lot of uh, lead left hooks. And he has powerful overhands in the in close range because he's kind of short, he's compact, and he can kind of, you know, bob and weave, duck shots, come over the top. He's good at mixing in uh, clinch knees to the body and the head in close range. And he can rattle opponents with those knees. And you also throw decent leg kicks, round kicks to the body, uh, good switch kicks. And eventually he will throw uh, side kicks to the head even, spinning kicks. And spinning back fist, he'll throw as well. But he isn't the lightest on his feet. He's flat-footed. And in the pocket, if you trade with him at range, if you trade with him, he can be kind of dangerous. But at range, you know, he isn't very dangerous. But, you know, in the pocket, like he's, like I said, he'll use his head movement. He'll bob and weave. He'll return with shots. And his low center of gravity and his speed does give him a good advantage there. But he doesn't have great defense at range. He holds his hands low. He tries to... Uh, 
use head and body movement, but he can get tagged entering the pocket. He ducks his head a lot. And it doesn't look like he has a great chin. And he has eight knockouts, but he's been finished by strikes one time. He doesn't look like a very offensive grappler. He will go for occasional takedowns. And he has decent takedown defense. He has heavy hips. He does a good job of uh, pushing the head down. And he will get occasional body lock and double legs. He's uh, good at finishing opponents when ground with ground and pound after he hurts them. Um, but I haven't seen much of him off his back. But I think Griffin may test that takedown defense. Uh, Griffin's going to be significantly bigger. And on top, I've seen him um, in people's guards, Murdoch, where his submission defense didn't look very good. He'll leave his arm bars very easily available to get, uh, you know, arm bar. He comes very defensive. If someone has a good guard, who even just stand up. And I don't think his BJJ is as good as Griffin. So if he gets takedowns, he should just look to, you know, pass guard, bait control time without taking much risk. But, um... He only has one submission. He has been submitted once. And uh, Murdoch needs to put the pressure on in this fight. Get inside. He has to close the space. Not allow Griffin uh, range to blitz in. Be explosive. And if he can keep it at boxing range. Um, you know. Inside the pocket. And forced to be more of a technical fight. That's where he's going to be effective. Um, I think he has better shot selection. And I think that he's harder to hit in close range. But you should look to uh, keep it standing, make Griffin pay for uh, takedown attempts if he takes them. But I think that Jordan Griffin's going to be able to, uh, you know, hit this guy from range as he tries to come in. And I think that he's going to hurt him bad. And I think that fight doesn't go the distance is a good bet. I think that Murdoch's going to be trying to pressure. I think Griffin's going to catch him as he comes in. I think that Griffin could also duck under, get a takedown. I think he has a big jujitsu advantage. And I'm going to say... Uh, Jordan Griffin via first round knockout or first round submission. Griffin's in a do or die position here. He's facing a a guy on short notice coming off a loss. So he has to make a statement here. He has to get a win and uh, prove that he's uh, here to stay in the UFC. So I'm going with Jordan Griffin to get it done via first round finish. And uh, up next here we have Eric Anders. And it's put up a shut up time for Eric Anders. You know, Anders, he was a slight favorite in his uh, first foray to 205 pounds. And he was brutally beaten by Khalil Roundtree. He showed incredible heart to make it all three rounds, but he was essentially a punching bag, and he got his leg destroyed. He was dropped multiple times, and it's crazy to me that he's coming back just two months later, man. Anders has fought seven times in the UFC in less than two years, and I think that's been a negative for his career. He hasn't given himself time to build a skill set and prove without getting ready for a fight, and He's lost three fights in a row, four or five, and he definitely needs a win here to save his job. So hopefully he's uh, 100% coming in here. But Anders, he's a pressure fighter. He does a good job of edging his way inside, pushing the opponent toward the cage, cutting him off. And, you know, he's always looking for that straight left hand. You also throw a one-two or, a, you know, a lead uppercut left hook. And he has a good left straight right hook combination as well. And when he's walking opponents down, let his hands go. He's pretty good. You know, he hits hard. He wears on opponents with the pressure. But... You know, when he's going backwards, he can be very low volume. He can't let go as much. And even when he's going forward, he could sometimes be very low volume. But, you know, he did get a nasty head kick knockout against Tim Williams. Um, that was his last win. He has lost a couple split decisions. So that, like I said, he kind of leaves it up in the air when he fights. And he's a pretty decent grappler. He does a good job of... Uh, you know, closing the distance for that single collar or the double unhook against the cage. And he's a strong guy. He can control position there. He'll look for singles, body locks. And he has a solid single leg in space as well. But in this fight, Anders definitely should keep it on the feet. Um, he needs to just cut Moreira off, force him into mistakes. He's going to be the smaller guy here, but he's more explosive. And, you know, Vinicius isn't the best wrestler. Um, if he can keep this fight on the feet, he isn't. Um, you know, and he isn't so damaged from a previous fight. It's his fight to lose, man. I mean, he's training at the same gym as Alonzo Menafield, who just knocked this guy out in round one. So he should have a good game plan. And he should be the much better striker here. But it's just whether Anders is going to lay an egg or he's going to do it. But, you know, Vin Vinicius, uh, he was knocked out quickly in his debut. And he's an elite jiu-jitsu guy. But there's question marks whether his overall game is UFC level. His striking is very raw, and if he can't get fights to the mat, he's a sitting duck virtually. He's very stiff on the feet. He doesn't have good technique, and he is very, you know, plodding footwork. Throws low output. He's flat-footed. Doesn't step into his punches. His hand speed is very slow. 
And uh, when he throws punches, he just doesn't bring his hands back to his head fast enough. He can get countered with clean shots. He will throw heavy kicks to the legs, body, and the head. He doesn't set them up well, but fighters have to respect the power on him, and he's not afraid of getting taken down, so he could throw those kicks 100%. And, um, you know, in his last match, he threw a spinning kick, and he left himself in danger, and that's where he got rocked. He doesn't have good defensive footwork. He just backs straight up when opponents throw instead of angling off. And his striking game is almost, you know, almost entirely throwing a big shot to fall into a takedown attempt. I mean, that's really all I see there. He will put heavy pressure on opponents at the beginning of rounds and really try to back them up. But his defense is atrocious, man. He's he's easier to hit than he is to miss. He gets insulted when you miss him, man. I mean, that's just the bottom line of it. He stands very tall. He leaves his chin exposed. He seems to have a, a good chin. He's willing to eat shots to get inside, but... He's been knocked out twice now, including in his last fight, and he has one TKO, but standing up, I don't see him as being a much threat at all, and he has a black belt, he's dangerous when he gets in top position, um, good job getting in on body locks, gets the cage, he'll work for single legs, trips, shoot doubles, gets the cage as well, and he's just a decent chain wrestler, um, he'll also shoot and pull guard, he has good half guard sweeps, and when he gets on top, you know, He's excellent. He has good guard passing skills. He can quickly move into dominant positions. A very strong mount. Great job of forcing opponents to give their backs. Good rear naked chokes. Good arm bars from the back. He also uh, sets up arm triangles very well from the mount. He's just heavy on top. Uh, you cements position and you aren't going to get up from under him. Good cardio and you know he does a good job staying very active when he gets to fight in his word on the ground. He has eight submissions. Uh, He's finished all nine of his wins, and he needs to get this fight to the ground. And I feel that if he can get into top position, he may only need one takedown to finish the match. So it is always a danger to fight a guy like this. And he should try to test the leg of round or of uh, the leg of Eric Anders because Roundtree really beat that leg up, man. So I don't think that leg could be a hundred percent. And his uh, wrestling really isn't great. I'm not sure he could take Anders down. Maybe he could drop him with the leg kick, get in top position that way. But if he gets top position, he can finish anyone, man. But Anders has to win this fight, right? I mean, I think he's a better athlete, the more explosive guy. He's miles ahead on the feet. He should be able to defend uh, these weak takedowns and take him out. I mean, Murray's big. If he could lay on Anders in a clinch for long periods of time, maybe he could tire him out and get it to the ground later. But as long as the fight stays standing and Anders just doesn't lay an egg, he should knock this guy out. If he walks him down, forces him into mistakes... He will make some, man, and this guy's hittable, and Anders should win via KOTKO in the first or second round, but for some reason, you know, I still can't trust Anders, especially at minus 350, and uh, not playing him here in this spot, but he should win, man. Anders should get this win. And up next, you have Ricardo Ramos, who's uh, going to be looking to bounce back. He kind of laid an egg in his last fight. He was finishing less than three minutes by uh, Saeed Nur- Nurmagomedov, and he got here with the body shot. TKO'd and prior to that he was 3-0 and in the UFC and he was getting a big fight here in Sergio Pettis but Pettis fell out and now he's taking on a UFC uh, debutante so hopefully he's still uh, you know 100% focused on this fight because sometimes when you get a letdown spot like that when you're supposed to be fighting a guy who's a mini legend and then you fight a UFC newcomer it kind of could throw you off a little bit but he is a fantastic athlete good striking jujitsu good leg kicks he will throw a good jab Good one two. He has a nice one two and a very good counter one two or a good very very good counter left hook. He will uh, rip the body with hooks in close range. Throw tight left hooks upstairs as well, and uh, very good rear uppercut. Good roundhouse question mark kicks. He'll throw front kicks, round kicks to the body. Good step in knees, spinning kicks, nasty spinning elbows. I mean we saw that against Amon Zahabi, but he doesn't throw much volume. And unless he addresses that, I see him being in a lot of close fights. Um, in his last fight, that was the first time he was TKO'd, and he does have two knockouts, and he's a jiu-jitsu champion, he's very dangerous with submissions in top and bottom, um, huge for Bantamweight, he definitely is gonna have a size advantage here against, uh, Newsom, and he likes to fake the level changes, come with the uppercut spinning elbows, strong in the clinch as well with knees, good body locks, and his takedown defense is good, man, he has an excellent get-up game, he could bounce right back to his feet, he's hard to control, He will also try to immediately attack with scramble or attack with submissions, create scrambles, fast hips, great arm bars, triangles. And, um, 
you know, he was taken down by uh, Mr. Perfect, King, and he was, King was able to control him with heavy pressure on his guard. He landed some elbows, but uh, Ramos was uh, eventually able to attack with the knee bar, almost get the finish, uh, used it to sweep, so he still showed some good jujitsu there. And, um, you know, on top, he likes to get the back at the rear naked choke. And he has six submissions in his career. He has been submitted one time. I think Ramos should have a advantage standing in this fight. And he has to control range with his kicks. Keep Newsom on the outside. If he can get his uh, leg kicks, front kicks to the body going, he may be able to eventually land a kick upstairs for the finish. Ramos definitely has the superior movement, the better striking. And if he can make Newsom fight off his back foot, I think he's going to be able to uh, potentially get a TKO stoppage. If Newsom is... Uh, Blitzing in very heavy. Maybe he should uh, think about ducking under getting a takedown. But he has to respect the jiu-jitsu of Newsom. But someone of his caliber, of Ramos's caliber, probably should be fine in top position. But Journey Newsom, he's jumping in here on short notice. And he's been very active recently. He had a boxing match where it was a draw on April 20th. Then he had an MMA fight where he won by knockout on May 9th. And now he's coming right back fighting June 29th. And uh, he's 9-1 in MMA with his one loss. It was uh, a loss to current UFC fighter Benito Lopez. And I found it really hard to find any tape on Newsom, but he was originally a jiu-jitsu guy. He recently tried to round out his game with boxing, and he looks like a short, stocky, powerful guy. He likes to, uh, you know, explode in with straight punch combinations. He throws a left hook straight right hand or a left hook right hook combination. And if he can land on the chin, he's shown power. But he doesn't have much variety in his shots. He doesn't have technical boxing. He will attack the body. And I've also seen him throw some round kicks. But he doesn't throw the kicks with fluidity. He is hittable. He doesn't move his head. He doesn't have great defense. When he fought uh, Benito Lopez, he was hit with some big shots. And it seemed like he just quit. He didn't get knocked out or anything. He just dropped down, let Lopez finish him off. And that was his one career loss. He has three KO, TKO wins. Two in a row. And he's coming into this matchup with some momentum. But uh, Newsom, he's a good jiu-jitsu fighter. It's going to be interesting to see how the BJJ matches up with Ramos's. And he isn't a great wrestler. He looks mainly for single legs. He will get in on singles against the cage, try to duck under, take the back. He'll also get double unders, try to get trips. And he's good at catching kicks. He's more of a control fighter on the ground. And he transitions very smoothly. If he can take top position against most guys, he's going to be able to control, work, dominate position. But I don't think he's going to be able to hold down Hamosh. And I haven't seen uh, Newsom's takedown defense test. And it could lead to some fun scrambles if uh, Hamosh can take him down. But uh, Newsom has three career submissions. He's never been submitted. And he's going to have to try to close the distance, land a big shot with his hands, or get it to the ground. Maybe he should try to attack with attack the body since we saw Ramos hurt there in his last fight. But he can't get stuck backing up or on the outside. He gets a longer Ramos who uh, throws solid kicks. If this fight goes to the ground, it will be intriguing to see if Newsom can pull something off there, but I think Hamosh is going to be able to dictate the range of the fight, back up Newsom, and not allow him to get inside. I think that Newsom's going to struggle fighting moving backwards. I don't think he's going to connect on many shots, and I could see Hamosh winning a lopsided decision if he respects the power of Newsom, but I could also see a finish with strikes if he lets go more. I think Hamosh should just... Look to keep it on the feet. Um, if he gets touched up a bit, then maybe he can time a takedown. But uh, my pick is going to be Hamosh via second round TKO in this fight. I think he's going to go in there uh, and want to make a statement and get it done here. So I'm going with Ricardo uh, Hamosh to get it done there. <laughs> and up next here we have the man, the myth, the legend, Paul Craig. He's looking to take out another 47 May guy here in Alonzo Menafield, But... Alonzo Menafield, he's been looking like a force of late. He's finished his last three fights by KO TKO in the first round. He had the fastest finish in uh, content- Dana White Contender Series history in eight seconds against Deshaun Boatwright. And uh, Menafield, he's an explosive, powerful athlete. He's a former pro football player, and he's fast. He throws with bad intentions. And he always starts very quickly. He tries to take opponents out right away. And he has a good jab, good one too. He likes to close the distance with a leaping left hook. But he leaves himself open to be countered. He also has been hit and rocked before in LFA, getting over-aggressive. He has nice kicks. He will throw hard leg and body kicks. He has decent head kicks. Good speed, and he needs to be more composed in this fight, though. He can't allow Craig to get in on his legs. He does have seven uh, 
wins by kill TKO in his eight pro fights that he has victories in. And uh, he's a knockout artist, I would say, but he's very physically strong. He has a nice takedown game. He has uh, good double legs. Good job of punching his way into takedowns. And when he gets on top, um, you know, he's pretty good. He's also very explosive. It's hard to stop from taking him down when he gets in on his legs. In the clinch, he's very strong as well. He has good knees. He'll look for singles and doubles. And he can land some big slams. Does a great job taking the back. Um, and he's good with naked chokes. He's heavy on top. Big elbows. If this fight, though, I wouldn't want to go to the ground with a guy like Paul Craig. But his takedown defense is a bit questionable. He was taken down a couple times by Daniel Jolly. But uh, he's explosive. He's hard to hold down. And he's going to have a big athleticism advantage here. Big striking advantage. If he keeps it on the feet, he's probably going to get the knockout. If he can get Craig to go backwards and stop a couple takedowns, I feel like he could break him, finish him. Craig will use the same entries into his one twos are into his one twos to the takedown every time. And if he can time that with a knee or an uppercut, he could get a walk off knockout. I also feel he could use a top position for ground and pound, but I wouldn't risk it. You know, keep it on the feet, try to knock him out. But <laughs> the prospect killer man, Paul Craig, he's returning to the octagon. He's gonna be trying to take out another four to seven May guy. Like I said, he took out Kennedy and Jeku earlier this year. And uh, Craig, he's been able to get two miraculous wins in the last three fights. You know, he cashes a big underdog in high fashion in both of those. And he finished them both in the final minute of the final round. Um, in fights he was losing, his career kind of has been the definition of it's never over till it's over. But I'm sure he'd like a more clean performance here. And he isn't a, gr- a great striker. He's kind of adapted his style. It's him better, in my opinion, than the style he had when he first came into the UFC. Uh, he was trying to stay longer early in his career, but now he likes to pressure forward. He'll throw one twos into single legs. He'll throw uh, straight hands, right hooks to the body, disguised level changes, good right uppercut, left hook, or a right uppercut, straight left uh, combination. And he likes to throw um, round and front kicks to the body. He also throw nice spinning kicks. If fighters pressure and close the distance on him, he struggles. You know, if you get him moving backwards, he's hittable. He doesn't react to other shots. And he has been finished by strikes twice. He doesn't have great power. And he only has one knockout in his whole career. But he's a good grappler. He's a dangerous submission artist. And he has good dirty boxing. He will attack with uppercuts, solid knees. He's open to be hit in close range. He doesn't show good defense. So he saw Khalil Roundry light him up in the clinch. But he has a pretty good single and double legs. And he showed improved wrestling against uh, Kennedy, and Clive, and Crute. He was able to take all of them down. And he will also shoot in on a takedown trap and arm and pull guard, which is pretty interesting. Um, you know, he was also shooting singles and trying to get in on leg locks to get the fight to the mat in his last fight. And he was relentless with takedown attempts against Kennedy. He showed excellent cardio. And he doesn't have incredible top control. Fighters are able to stand up from under him, but he will attack with front chokes, uh, land short punches and elbows off of his back when he gets taken down. And, you know... Off of his back, he's dangerous. If you're in his guard, he has nasty triangles, arm bars. He'll land, uh, you know, shots off of his back. And he's better off his back, in my opinion, than on top. He has five career triangles. But if you pass his guard, then you are able to hold him down, beat him up a little bit. But he does do a good job being calm, surviving. He just needs one moment to lock up one of those submissions. And his cardio is good. He's able to go hard for three rounds. He has 10 submissions. He has been submitted one time. And his last seven wins are all via submission. Neither fighter has ever gotten a decision in their careers. And I don't expect that to change here. Menafield has never even been in the third round. And Craig is going to need to push the pace, get the fight to the ground. He has to go forward, make the fight ugly. If he can pull guard or end up in top position any way possible, that's his best chance to win. But I think Menafield's going to be coming in here for revenge and to make a statement. I see him being the physically stronger fighter, the much faster fighter. I see him walking Craig down, forcing bad single leg shots. I see him countering his takedown attempts with knees, with uppercuts. And I see him being ready for the style of Craig, know he, how he tries to fight. He just saw his teammate Kennedy almost beat him. And he's more experienced, better than Kennedy is. So I, I will say... uh. It's going to be Alonzo Menafield via first round KOTKO in this fight. And up next year, we have Drew Dober taking on Polo Reyes. And looking at it, man, looking at the tape, you know, I, I can't believe I... Uh, actually, I don't remember if I picked Polo Reyes or Demir, but I remember thinking that fight was going to be close. And uh, watching the tape back on Polo Reyes, man, I just... Uh, I don't know. I, I wasn't as impressed as, uh, you know... 
I, I don't know. I didn't think he was as good as I remembered. You know, he's been struggling as of late. He's been knocked out in two of his last three fights. He's 34. I think he's kind of fading a little bit. He's very one-dimensional. He's purely a, a boxer brawler. And he wants to inch his way into range, cut opponents off, back him towards the cage, get in a firefight. And he has a good jab, a good left hook. He'll throw one-twos and, you know, his overhand rights. And he'll close the distance with straight punching combinations. Uh, he'll attack the body. In the pocket, he's dangerous, man. If you plant your feet and trade with him, brutal power in that right hand, he can close the show. But struggles mightily with movement. He will try to double jab into range, blitz in, but... He's just not that fast. And fighters with good movement, solid kicks can pick him apart. He's heavy on his lead leg. He's susceptible to leg kicks. He'll also take a, take a shot to give a shot. And he isn't the most defensively sound. Um, he's won seven fights via KO, TKO. But he's been finished four times by strikes. His chin is definitely questionable now. And he's not a good grappler, man. His takedown defense is terrible. He allows fighters in deep on his legs, especially with double legs. He'll try to stuff the head. But most of the time, you know, he's going down. He's... Has 37% takedown defense. He can be taken down with body locks very easily. And really any takedowns in space. Um, he's better at defending takedowns when he's against the cage. He can kind of use the cage to change position. Create scrambles. Um, you know, but his top game when he gets on top is not dangerous. He isn't a passer. He kind of just tries to posture up. Land some shots from your guard. Um, he doesn't have great submission defense either. And fighters are able to use their guard to tie him up. Negate much damage. And uh, when he's on his back, his defense is not good. He was quickly finished with ground and pound in his last fight against Demir Hadzovic. Doesn't have a very good guard. And fighters are able to easily pass his guard. You know, Novelli was able to take his back in the dying seconds of their fight. He has been submitted two times. He's won a career submission. And I don't think he's much of a threat to submit anyone unless he really hurts him with punches. But Ray's is going to need to stand his ground, control the center of the cage. I think he should try to wait for Dober to... Uh, come in, try to catch him with a big shot that knocks him out. Sometimes Dover leaves himself a little bit open as he enters the pocket. If Reyes can keep it standing, make it a close-range fight, then he's going to have a, an advantage, I guess. But to me, man, Drew Dober, um, he's, he won three straight fights before he lost his last fight to Benil Dariush. And, um, you know, he's a huge 55er. He's a southpaw. He's very explosive. Much lighter on his feet, more tools at his disposal than Ray is. Heavy low kicks, and when he, you know, he needs to use those early and often in this fight. He has a nice jab. He'll throw a nice left hook straight right hand. And he's good at bobbing, weaving punches in close range, coming over the top with hooks, overhands. Good at uh, using feints to draw up movements, which I think is going to be pivotal here. And he also has very good body and head kicks with the rear leg, and he keeps a high pace. And he doesn't throw in combination, but he'll just throw a ton of shots, break opponents down. He puts pressure on them, makes the cage small, and he has better disc control than Reyes. Um, you know, he has to be very aware of the power, but just mind his P's and Q's on the feet, and he should be uh, outstriking them. And he has power himself with seven knockouts. He's only been finished by strikes one time. And Dober is the much better wrestler here in this fight. He has good control in the clinch. He likes to dig double underhooks, get body locks, and he's good at timing double legs. And I feel he can get takedowns on Reyes, and Reyes won't be able to get up. If he mixes in takedowns, he maybe could even finish it on top. And he's heavy on top. He doesn't do a lot of damage. He's not a big submission threat. But he will control on top, advance position. Um, he could try to get the crucifix position from half guard, from side control. And against a guy like Polo Reyes, he may be able to open up a little bit more and show more of what he what he has on top. And uh, Dobra has solid takedown defense. But he's really struggled with uh, grapplers over his career. He, his last three losses have been by submission. He won't have to worry about that here. Um, he does have five submissions, but he's going to need to uh, be technical on the feet, use his leg kicks, back raise up, and go for the takedown. If he can get a takedown in round one, maybe then he could start to faint, come over the top with big hooks in the later rounds. Um, Dober should look to have a heavy wrestling game plan here, though. Reyes won't be able to stop it. There's no reason to keep it on the feet and give Reyes a chance to catch him. Um... And, you know, uh, Drew Dober's a confident pick for me. I think he's the cleaner striker. He should be able to uh, land kicks, mix in takedowns to open up his hands. And uh, just win an easy uh, decision victory or potentially get a finish in this fight. I think Reyes also gasses out. So I just think Dober has a big advantage everywhere. And I'm going with Drew Dober to get the win here. And up next, we have a pretty fun fight here. I think it's a close fight with Roosevelt Roberts taking on Vince Pichel. 
And uh, Roberts is a big favorite coming in here. And he's still young in his career. This is a big step up in competition. And he's a good prospect. He has nice leg kicks, good front kicks to the body. Good one-two, good jab, right hook. And he was looking a lot more confident with his hands in his last fight. He has a good um, left hook. He throws backing up. He allows himself to get backed up, though. But he has good head movement, hand speed. And he's able to counter moving backwards, stay long. Uh, good job of countering with the jab. He'll keep the jab in your face, but he keeps his chin a bit high. Good fighters could cont- potentially counter that with clean punches. He does do a good job parrying, using head movement to avoid shots, and he also likes to throw uh, hooks, counter uppercuts in the pocket, but can be a bit flat-footed, tends to lean back to avoid shots at times instead of using ladder movement. And um, he does have solid power in his hands. He has three knockouts, but most of those have come on the ground. He's never been uh, defeated, so he's never been knocked out. And he's a great wrestler. He's a submission grappler. He can get backed up controlled in the clinch, but he's very dangerous there. He could snatch up front chokes. He got a nasty guillotine against Daryl Horcher. And he's explosive uh, close to the distance with double legs. He can elevate, get slam takedowns. He's also very strong in the clinch with body locks. And on top, he does a great job passing, moving in dominant positions. He can land big punishment. He gets a high mount. He's very hard to buck off. Um, he can land hard with less ground and pound. He does a good job of uh, landing frame elbows and forcing his opponents to give their backs or get TKO'd. And then he has a good rear a choke. He is uh, dangerous with uh, standing chokes. And he could jump on guillotines, front chokes. Four career submissions, three guillotines, and a rear naked choke. And he went to decision for the first time in his career. In his last fight, he showed solid cardio. This is the stiffest test of his career. And someone who poses a real threat. I see Robert trying to use his athleticism, lateral movement to move and counter. I think he's going to try to counter with straight kick shots down the middle. I see him trying to uh, time the entries of Pichel, duck under, get body locks. If he gets on top of Pichel, he needs to be uh, weary of the arm bar, But... I think he could get a sub if uh, Bichot exposes his neck to stand up. But um, Vince Bichot, he's looking to get back in the win column here. He was dominated, submitted in his last fight against Gregor Gillespie. But Gillespie is a monster, man. He's going to do that to a lot of people. Bichot is 36. He needs a win here to stay uh, relevant. It seems he's been relegated to gatekeeper status at this point. This is a second stud prospect he's had to face back-to-back and. Pichot, he's a big, powerful fighter. He has one-punch knockout power. He has a good footwork, forward pressure. Good job cutting the cage off. He will cut the cage off by switching stances. And he has knockout power from both sides. He starts fights with a lot of big leg kicks, both inside and outside. He'll close the distance with big chopping leg kicks. He has a stiff jab. He feints his way in well. Uh, very nice J right hand, left hook. He'll throw uh, heavy overhand rights. And he'll use his overhand rights, right hooks to crash in a clinch against the cage. Good kicks as well with both legs. He'll throw a nice switch kicks to the head when he gets opponents inside. He likes to throw uppercuts. And he's a big, powerful dude. He has knockout power. He has uh, eight knockouts. He's ne- he's only been knocked out one time. And he's a uh, you know, physical guy for the division. He's a solid offensive wrestler. Good body locks, double legs. And he has good blast double in space. He will also attack in the clinch with good knees to the head against the cage. Good body locks, doubles from there as well. But in this fight, I would look to keep it on the feet. He tends to get a bit tired when he wrestles. He doesn't have the best top control. I'm not sure the energy exertion will be worth it to take down Roberts. His takedown defense isn't the best, but he's hard to hold down. He has good get-ups. He'll try to uh, make opponents pay when they get in on his leg with big uppercuts, big shots. But he gives up takedowns a little easily. He will try to counter with front chokes, snap opponents down. But uh, once he gets taken down, he has a good butterfly guard. He will try to attack with the arm bars. He's solid at bellying down and the single legs getting back up. But uh, in his last fight, he was ultimately submitted with an arm triangle in round two. And I feel with the long lives of Roberts, the way that he stands up, it could expose him to a, a guillotine or a Darce or an anaconda. But uh, Pichel needs to pressure forward, jam the kicks, the straight punches of Roberts, test that chin. He needs to be aggressive, uh, stuff the takedowns, take it to him, bully him. You know, Pichel hits hard. He's physically strong. And Roberts is a quicker, slender guy. And if he can use his forward pressure, throw hard shots, constantly make Roberts skirt the cage, he could win a decision victory or get a knockout. And the line is off, in my opinion. I think if Roberts can't get takedowns, he's going to be in a little bit of trouble. Pichel isn't 
shown good takedown defense over his career, and it's hard to trust it. I do think Pichot is live for a knockout, but I think he's going to be going forward, pushing Roberts back. If, and if he can get him in close quarters, he has the power to finish. I think that Roberts will be able to bail himself out, though, with takedowns, make the striking competitive enough. And I think that Roberts will most likely be able to find a choke submission over the three rounds. But to me, man, this is dog or pass. And I feel the Pichot line has good value on it. So my pick's going to be Roosevelt Roberts via submission. But I think it's a very close fight. And I think the line is pretty off. And man, I mean, this fight, why did the UFC do this to me, man? I mean, I love both these guys. Uh, if you've been watching the show, you've noticed that, you know, I've been picking Rocco Martin. I've been rocking with that dude for a while. Uh, we made some good money on him, picking him against, you know, Kita Nakamura. He was a close guy, close favorite, or I, I believe, against uh, Ryan LaFleur. He was the underdog. Against Jake Matthews, he was the underdog. Uh fairly I think he's a fairly decent favorite and his last fight against Sergio Marais but he won once again there and you know he's taking on my boy Damian Maya who in his last fight a lot of people were uh, talking shit about Maya saying that he was done too and he kind of shut them all up really quick with that very fast mission on Lyman Good but you know this is an interesting fight man um I've been going back and forth in this fight if, you know like I said uh I think that Maya's going to be able to be the bigger guy here because Rocco is coming up from 55. Maya used to be a 185-er. And um, Rocco only has one career knockout with a head kick. So, I mean, in his hands, obviously, he doesn't have that one-punch knockout power. And Maya, you know, he's only been knocked out one time. So, I mean, that was at 185 pounds as well. And he isn't a guy that takes a lot of damage. I mean, he's 41 years old, so people... Might say, oh, I mean, his chin is going, he wants to retire, I mean, he maybe lacks the desire, but I mean, Lyman Good, I mean, did Lyman Good hit him at all when he fought Lyman Good? I mean, when he fought uh, Carlos Condit, did Carlos Condit hit him at all? When he fought Matt Brown, did Matt Brown touch him? When he fought Gunnar Nelson, Neil Magny, I mean, all these guys, he's like running through him without even taking any damage, so to me, I mean, if you look at his last fight, even... I mean, when he fought Tyron Woodley, he took a lot of damage in that fight. I mean, his face was pretty battered up. Same thing with Colby Covington, but I wouldn't say it's like he took a cuss of blows in those fights. It wasn't like he was rocked. He never, you know, got stung super bad. And against Usman, you know, he didn't he didn't get hit with any big shots really in that fight. Um, but, you know... Rocco Martin, he's very confident recently. He's very good with his distance control. And he's going to be trying to low, land those low calf kicks to me. Because I think that's going to be pivotal in this fight. I think that what's going to be pivotal is who could set it up. Who could be first. You know, if Mike could be the first guy to get the takedown. Implement his game plan first. And I think he's probably going to win. If uh, Rocco could land those leg kicks early on. Slow the movement. Slow the, uh, you know the drive or just kind of negate the drive on the takedowns of Maya, then he's going to have a good chance to win. And I think that obviously Martin is going to be the quicker guy uh, with his footwork, with his hand speed, with his uh, kicking speed. And he's going to have to be moving and angling, uh, keeping D Damien on the outside, not letting him get inside. But the thing is, man, I mean, Rocco lets a lot of people get inside. You know, Sergio Marais was able to get a takedown on Rocco Martin in like, the first 10 seconds of the fight, even though he was able to get back up. But, um, you know, in this fight, he has to pressure forward. He has to be the one going forward. And, you know, but I see Maya being able to eat the shots of Rocco and continue to press forward. And I see him getting an early takedown. The scramble is going to be the indication to me on who's going to win the fight. If Rocco can scramble back to his feet or even a top position and uh, be safe from there. I mean, we've seen some guys like Chris Weidman be able to control him on top. I'm going to be impressed if Rocco can control him on top. But even if he can get up, um, then that's going to be very, very key to the fight. If my cements position, I could see it being a wash and repeat to me. But this is a 50-50 fight, so the value's on Martin. But for the pick, man, I mean, when you see the type of takedowns that Rocco gets taken down with, the single leg is something that he struggles with. Uh, Olivier Aubon Mercier was able to get that single leg into the underhook to the kind of the body lock, the back take position. And um, he was able to take him down with dumps through that as well. And I think that Maya, man, I think that 
when he feels Maya's grip strength, I think that like when he feels that the strength of Maya on that single leg, uh, when he starts to feel that grappling pressure, he's gonna be shocked. I mean, we've heard guys like George Masvidal say it, man. I mean, that's the strongest guy he's ever been in the cage with. He said, and you know, I feel like that grip strength is just something else, man. I think that. Um, you know, he's going to be able to tire out Rocco a little bit with that grappling pressure, start to take over. And I don't think Rocco's going to get submitted. I think he may even win a round. I think this is going to be a close competitive fight. But I'm going to say Damian Maya wins this fight via decision. So I'm going with Damian Maya via decision here. And up next here, we have an excellent fight. We have a rematch with Juicy Formiga, who's, you know, his striking is night and day from the first time when he fought Joseph Benavidez. And it makes for a much more interesting fight because now... Formiga, his striking is is uh, came a long way. Where now he throws a lot of straight punches. He throws a lot of kicks. He has good timing on the spinning back fist. I mean, we saw the way that he timed that on uh, Ben Wynn knocked him out. And you know the thing is, is I think that Juicy Formiga is gonna be trying to uh, have a similar game plan to his last fight. Like I said, stay long, use the jab, use the straight punches, use those kicks, use his movement. And uh, time duck on for takedowns. And if he can take Joseph Benavidez down, that's going to be very, very impressive for one. But, I mean, when those takedowns he had against Stevenson were awesome, man. I mean, excellent timing on those double legs. Drove right through. Easy takedowns. Easy control on top. And, I mean, his jiu-jitsu level is incredible. I mean, if he can get on top of you, you're probably not going to get up. And if he can take your back, you might get submitted. You might get control for the whole round get 10 aided So, uh... You know, Juicy A is one of the best fighters in the world, no doubt. But in the first fight with Joseph Benavidez, what he really struggled with was the speed, man. Because Benavidez was able to go forward without the fear of getting taken down. Because Benavidez is such a good wrestler that he doesn't fear Formiga shooting in on him and taking him down. He knows that, hey, if he tries to take me down, I'm going to stuff this takedown. I can even get in top position. I can beat him up from there. And, um, you know, I think that Formiga has improved a lot. But I still don't think he's as fast as Benavidez. And I think this fight is going to be similar to the Ray Borg fight. Where I think that Formiga's striking is good enough now that Benavidez is going to be more willing to engage in these grappling scrambles with Formiga. Maybe even shoot a few takedowns. And But I just think that Benavidez is going to be the one pressing forward all the time. I think that Benavidez is going to be the one uh, landing the more significant shots. And I think that for Formiga to win, he's either going to have to... You know, catch him with some shots as he closes his distance, run into him and stun him, drop uh, Benavidez, have some big moments in the fight, or have success with a lot of takedowns, which I think that's going to be a hard proposition in terms of taking him down. I think that outstriking him is probably the easier path to victory. But, you know, I just feel like Benavidez, you know, since he washed that dust off against Sergio Pettis in his last fight, he looked so fast, man, when he was fighting Perez. Looks really good, looks powerful, and I just don't think that Formiga's on that same wavelength. I don't think he's the same level of athlete, and I feel like if this fight, even if it's close at the end, both these guys have to dig deep to get the win. I think that Joseph Benavides is a try-hard type guy. He's a guy that, you know, he's going to go hard. He's going to go full exertion for the finish, so I think that if this becomes a dogfight for the you know, the win in the third round. I think that Benavidez is going to pull it out also. So I'm going to go with Benavidez via decision in this fight. But definitely think that Formiga has improved a lot. And it could even be, you know, a split decision. But I'm going to go with Benavidez to get the win here. And uh, we have the main event here with JDS gets in Ganu. And um, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm not, I'm not salty about it. But I was really looking forward to this fight being on UFC 239, man. I'm going to UFC 239 and... Took this fight away, gave it to you uh, motherfuckers in Minnesota. So enjoy that shit. Have a good uh, <laughs> time watching that main event. But, you know, I think in this fight, uh, I think it's funny, you know, Francis Ngannou talking that shit about Junior Dos Santos' uh, black belt. He's like, oh, I don't think he have a black belt. The reason why I think he's doing that is because I think he wants JDS to come try to take him down. You know, I think he wants JDS to come forward like Overeem did try to take him down. But... In my opinion, to this fight, it's going to be uh, JDS moving, trying to work tactical boxing, angling and countering, and, um, you know, the Predator trying to come forward, cut the cage off, and take take that fool's head off. So, 
you know, it's going to be an interesting fight. You know, Junior Dos Santos has looked really good lately. But, you know, even against Tai Tuivasa, he was getting hit with some a couple shots. He was getting backed up. And, man, I mean, against a guy like Francis Ngannou, you can't make any mistakes, man. You can't make any mistakes. It, I just feel like Ngannou can make mistakes against Dos Santos. I mean, we haven't seen anyone stun Ngannou, hurt him with a big shot. Ngannou is very durable from what we've seen. I mean, we saw him take hellacious blows against Stephen Miocic, even when he was tired. And, uh, you know, he was never rocked. So, and the thing is, I mean, his just... You like? Did you see that shot he hit Kane with? He just touched him in the back of the head, or touched him with that whatever shot that was. I don't even remember. And it was like barely landed, and he knocked him out. I mean, that's the type of power you're dealing with the dealing with here. And you know, just the way that Junior Santos circles. I mean, that's been an issue his whole career. The way that he circles off the cage, he's just a little bit hittable. And man, I mean, in this fight for Junior to win, he's gonna have to have a perfect fight, or he's gonna have to, you know. Time a knockout shot, knock him out. I don't think that he's going to take him down. I really don't. I mean, they might be talk about that. I know some people are probably going to be like, oh, like, Junior should go for takedowns because Stipe took him down and he looked terrible on the ground. But, man, I mean, we just saw Kane, who's a takedown machine. He's a guy that loves getting takedowns to try to get in on Francis and get knocked out. So, to me, I mean, I don't think going after a guy like Francis Ngannou is going to be the game plan. I think that... You have to be like um, Stipe at least early on where you have to kind of weather the storm. You have to fight smart, try to kind of uh, make it into a deep water. And that's why this fight is a little bit more interesting than the third three-round fight. Even though I don't think it's going to go to five rounds. I mean, no way in my opinion. But if this fight starts dragging on, you know, four or five, then Junior may be the fresher guy and... Junior isn't going to be afraid to let go, or not afraid to let go. I'm not going to say Stipe was afraid to let go, but Stipe had a much more grappling-heavy game plan. And I think that if he gets tired, that tired, like he did against Stipe against Junior, that Junior's going to capitalize and knock him out. But, man, I mean, do I think that Junior's going to be able to survive for, you know, the first three rounds to be able to get it to that position? I, I, I just don't see it, man. I think that at some point, I just really do. I think that... And Ganu is a freak, dude. I mean, this guy, I think at some point he's going to be, he's going to hit him. He's going to touch him. And I think that that Junior's not going to be able to take the power, man. I think that Junior's going to get knocked out. So that's the bottom line about it. I mean, I picked him against uh, Cain Velasquez. He won that fight. And it looks like he's kind of going on a tour of defeating all these uh, legend heavyweights. Uh, Kane, JDS back-to-back. I mean, those might be the two best heavyweights besides Stipe in the history of the UFC. So if you can collect those two scops, I mean, this guy's starting to, you know, jump into the pantheon of these great uh, heavyweights. You know, if he could beat Kane, beat JDS, maybe get the title later on in the day. You know, I mean, he's he's building a pretty good legacy for himself. But, I mean, he still has to do it first. He still has to take out take out JDS. JDS is, can't be slept on, you know, and uh, he can't get this win here, but... If you put a gun to my head and you said, who are you going to bet on, man? I, I could not bet against a guy like Fritz Zinganu. So I'm going to have to pick Fritz Zinganu. I just think that he's more dangerous. He's more explosive. And he's going to be able to catch Junior Dos Santos at one point and uh, get the knockout. So I'm going with uh, Francis Zinganu to get the win in that fight. And uh, for the parlay of the week for this week, I'm going to give you guys uh, Jordan Griffin and Drew Dober as the parlay of the week. And my most confident pick is going to be Jared Gordon. And uh, we fit two other parlay of the weeks in a row, so we fit back to back. Hopefully, we can hit this third one in a row here on the Dana White Contender Series coming up tomorrow. So I have that video uploaded already. Um, unfortunately, you know Victor Reyna against M- Miguel Baeza, he came in fifty or er, fifteen pounds, seven pounds overweight, where he was one hundred seventy-eight pounds. The fight is still going on, and I still think that Baeza is going to win, but. You know, very unprofessional from Reyna. Even though he was taking the fight on short notice, that's his dream to be in the UFC. I'm sure that with the win, unless he gets like a knockout in five seconds, I don't think that Reyna is going to be making it into the UFC with that weight that weight cut issue. But, you know, um, yeah, so check that out if you're going to be betting on the Dana White Tender Series tomorrow. Um, tell me who you're going to be betting on in this event. Make sure to comment, like, subscribe, uh, leave a donation in uh, PayPal, and... Uh, 
Thanks for watching, guys, and hopefully we're going to catch these bets again and have a great time watching the fights. And, man, I can't wait for uh, JDS versus Ganu. So, uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys next Monday for UFC 239.